My name is Alex. I work for Acropolis uh, uh, team. We are making uh, some uh, future financial systems, uh, such as uh, our current products is uh, uh, Credit Pool and uh, Polka Hub. Uh, we did a presentation at dot, dot, dot com about Polka Hub, about what, what it will be. And now we are finished uh, to implement it. And uh, basically, uh, you, you can think of this of it uh, like Heroku, but uh, for substrate-based nodes. So it, it is uh, a hosted service with uh, its own CI built and all the dockerization that you would need, but it, it's managed uh, via our TLI, basically. So take a screen share. This is the project uh, overview of uh, Polka Hub. Uh, it has all the components like our CLI, backend, uh, some email sending, and the link to our Polka Hub portal. Uh, here you can see uh, all the built projects of uh, Polkadot, uh, different Polkadot versions like Kusama or Alexander. I don't think. It's fetching. <laughs> okay, let me just. Sometimes it's ha it happens. Yeah. Uh, uh, you can see here uh, pre built images for different uh, chains. Like, for example, we have Alexander on uh, version uh, 0 0.4 and Kostama on version 0 0.7. Uh, what this means, the, uh, these are pre-built images from which you can deploy these nodes just with one comment. Uh, so basically, how it works. Uh, let me, oh, my node's still building, oh no. <laughs> I was hoping it will finish. Okay, we have our CLI, which can be installed by Simple script. Yeah, I don't know. So this script uh, installs the uh, CLI on your computer. Oh. Well, yeah. And now you can look for pre-built images. Oh, I think I need to be, oh yes, we have a simple registration, which uh, we are doing with uh, e emailing service. Yes, it asks me for an email and I'll give it to, to it. So basically, what I'm doing, I'm authorizing uh, for our CLI that will uh, manage some backend uh, actions. Right. And now I can try and find the nodes. Uh, you, you can see here, uh, that basically, it's the same description uh, we saw on, on the port, on our port portal. Here you can, see, you can see the same. And uh, from this point, uh, we can, uh, I believe I have Polkadot built, or no. No, I, I do not have. Okay, I have my notes. I can show you the content. It's really simple. Actually, much. Yes. Uh, so I have a runtime with a uh, chain worker. I called it uh, ESS Tracker for it will uh, track the International Space Station for us. Uh, I will track. What does it track? Uh, oh, the space station. Yes, uh, in real time. Oh, cool. Uh, 
I basically used uh, the latest chain worker example, and uh, I think I did all the parsing right. Yeah, it's just simple URL. You, you, can, you can just try it if you want. So it basically queries that api.opennotify.org and they run an endpoint that tells you where the space station is and you have an off-chain worker that fetches that yeah. data and puts it on chain? Yeah. Cool. So what am I go going to do now? I will check if I will have, um, yeah, I have my, uh, this is a specific file. Uh, if I have a node and I want to deploy it to, to, uh, to uh, Hub servers, uh, I'll, I can uh, create a HubSummer file and uh, let me show you. All I have here, uh, the name, the description, the ver version you want to specify, that elementary uh, URL, I'm not sure if it's working now, but uh, it will be. So what I'm go going to do, I will register new project. You, you can see here, uh, I created a project. Our backend uh, notified me that I have uh, now uh, uh, two endpoints. It, it's, uh, it, it was registered uh, through Cloudflare Manager, also one of our microservices. And I have been given a re remote that I can simply add to our Git. Git. Hey, okay, I, I have a question already real quick. So yeah. like this uh, space station tracker is some node that you had laying around on your system that you worked on and it's supposed to be representative of like whatever project it is that each one of us cares yeah. about. Uh, so any, any substrate based chain. Okay, so for me, it might be the recipes. For Alex, it might be Joystream. You know, it might be Totem. Who knows what it yeah. is? Yeah. And now you're using... Exactly you're using this uh, Polka Hub and it's sort of, I guess like based on the name and how I'm seeing you use it, it's sort of like analogous to Docker Hub or GitHub or something like that? Mm. Or not? Yeah, yeah. it's uh, yeah. kind of Docker Hub, uh, but mm, it has its differences. So now mm -hmm. I have uh, two remotes and uh, I have my hub demo file. Maybe I should change a version for it to catch up. Let me real quick. So, and now I'll commit a new version of uh, HubTunnel. Uh, maybe I missed something. What is the space about that? And um, it, uh, I, I made a simple off-chain worker uh, that uh, fetches uh, the International Space Station uh, location real-time. What is it, the International Space Station? Um, the one that uh, floating above our heads uh, any day. Yeah, so, like, it's uh, like a... A satellite that they're doing research in outer space, yeah. right, orbiting the Earth. It make, makes photo. They they monitor in atmosphere and, and the, uh, like stuff. Uh, it's not 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 that important. Uh, what is going uh, uh, to uh, to happen now? Uh, our Polka Hub is it's just a simple server that receives. Uh, it's. Uh, just private git, uh, git, reg git registry. You push uh, your code and uh, have to all there uh, with a specified version or uh, other metadata, and uh, it will initiate uh, a deploy. Uh, it's, it will create like a pod uh, in a Kubernetes cluster and uh, 
uh, it all will be uh, running by Docker and you, if you are confused by now, it's uh, totally okay. So uh, the main uh, advantage is uh, you can get rid of uh, setting out uh, your, uh, your server for it and you can just use a pre-built one. I'm not sure. Yeah, basically at this point uh, I, I will wait for uh, CI to, to to build so I can hand over a screen share. I if any anyone have questions uh, for what it what it's for and uh, what what is happening, I will, I will be glad to answer. So, so is like you just a second ago you had that tab that had a bunch of different nodes listed kusama was one of them i think is like when you yep. is the idea that your space station node is now going to be listed on this list yep exactly oh i see it I yeah okay. one, but, uh and uh, for kusama i made uh, exactly the same i just cloned the worker uh, repository i checked out uh, the kusama version branch uh, and uh, edit a, a remote, edit a project uh, for Kusama, edit a remote, and push uh, my changes. And oh, uh, and then uh, our Jen Jenkins uh, CI will uh, start to build. And uh, after it builds, uh, we have this project. After that, we can uh, deploy. It's uh, this project uh, that, that you, you see now is like uh, Docker images, basically. It, it is Docker images just uh, in the private server. So yeah, it's like uh, Docker Hub, but uh, there is more. Uh, using these uh, Docker images and using uh, Docker Hub install command, you can deploy uh, this node in uh, our cluster just with one, one command. And uh, you can specify a version uh, uh, that you want. You can rename it, uh, so you can uh, you can deploy Kusama image, but uh, with the name of uh, I don't know um, a devil devil node. Okay, and so when you ran up and run like. Yeah, like in yeah. your command history, there I see the second or the most recent thing you ran was git push. So like, did that, where did that push to? A, a Polka Hub specific repo, like that repo that it gave you earlier? Oh, actually you are right. I just need to, <laughs> yeah, I need to push. Ah, oh, oh, it pushed to like yeah, GitHub or yeah, somewhere. Yeah, you're different. right. Okay, I'm, I'm glad we caught that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good, so it would be inconvenient. Yeah. So here I just uh, repeat my. Uh, and I also had a question about the the login. So, um, like, what does it take yep. in order to to use this? I assume you're not just going to let anybody like. I mean, you guys are paying the bill for running these cloud servers, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. What does it take to participate? Yeah, that that is the question I cannot answer right now because I'm not okay. sure uh, how it will, will be monetized and, and stuff. Just, uh, just for now, it's uh, like it's all experimental. It's all uh, just to uh, play out if you like it or no. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, the the question is open. Okay, so like so at the now, moment, just for practical purposes, like if one of us thinks this is cool and wants to use it, we just like ask you or someone at Acropolis, hey, can we get an account? Yeah, sure. And like, probably the answer is yes until we start abusing it or something like that. We, we already have a registration through an email which just uh, generates some token for you. Okay. You have yeah, an account. Cool. Cool. It's simple. Uh, all the process uh, described on the, our monorepo, or, or actually we have a, yeah, on, on this uh, website we have a, a reference to the tutorial which will drive you through the basic process. So yeah, uh, for now, I think I'll, I'll have the screen share. As you see, uh, I, I pushed my node uh, to the server and uh, all the, oh, actually now I, I think I can see, 
we'll see the Jenkins build. I think. No. Hmm. Something. Something strange. Okay. Let Let me uh, investigate it. <laughs> I think. I, would, uh, I have one, yeah, one more question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this is um, so Pokehub. Is this the like primary product of Acropolis, or is this something like a side thing that you guys no, have developed I, because you needed it? Uh, uh, this is a project we developed uh, for uh, the whole Polka, Polka dot ecosystem, just to get your nodes up and running. Uh, like, like you saw, I did it uh, in, in five minutes with, uh, when you have uh, already uh, written substrate nodes code. Yeah. Just from it, at the, uh, create a, a project in Polka Hub. Uh, push it to the Polka Hub registry and uh, after it builds you can uh, deploy any quantity of nodes in no time. Cool. That's the, the whole purpose. Uh, it, uh, in, in my opinion it, it uh, helps to deploy nodes when you need to, to, to do it fast. Yeah, cool. Okay. So All right, good. So then the, the plan is like you push that to this specific Git repo associated with Polka Hub. It's going to build. After Chris is done, we're going to come back and take a look and you're going to show us yeah. that there's yeah. like a node running in the cloud, I guess, right? Sure. I will launch locally my apps, uh, Polka.js, and uh, yeah. just pass uh, this, this link here. That's all. But where, where it deploys? On what servers? Uh, on Polka Hub servers. On uh, our Cloudflare man manager registers all this uh, all this stuff with uh, the name of a uh, project and uh, it, uh, it runs on uh, our Kubernetes cluster. So it builds on your servers and then it launches the blockchain on your servers? Yeah. Uh, as, as I told, it's more like uh, Heroku uh, than Docker Hub. Heroku uh, gives you um, opportunity to launch your server on on paid servers and uh, don't pay for uh, hosting. But uh, okay, but these blockchains uh, blockchains consumes a lot of space. So you you have I don't know. So you're going to provide this uh, hundreds of uh, gigabytes per every project, per every version of every project? Or how do you see it? Yeah, I think th this is the question uh, to answer in the future, I guess. It's more like a, uh, the, the main goal of this project is just to help the ecosystem in, in what way and how uh, it can, can develop and pivot. Right now, I, I, I cannot answer. So like, right, it sounds like right now, this is a, like Acropolis is being a little bit like altruistic, right? Like, yes, you're paying the bill. Yes, it's not monetized yet. And like, maybe eventually that will be necessary. Uh, but like for right now, people are developing these parachains. They're mostly not hundreds of gigabytes yet, although many of them will be eventually. So like for now, you guys are just floating the bill and then we'll see where it goes. Is that sort of it? Yeah, uh, basically it is. Okay, cool. So let me hand, hand uh, Chris the share. Maybe I'll take this opportunity to try to uh, see if anybody else wants to present anything at a future session. If you have like a project that you've worked on or are working on, that's great. We'd love to see it. Yeah, when you ask, actually, I was thinking about the stuff I'm working on right now, which are not really ready. So I don't have mm -hmm. anything I can really show now. But if you consider the stuff I worked and published already, what we could do is a quick intro on um, SR tool, which okay. is the tool I wrote that allows you to validate um, substrate runtimes. So it's probably not going to take an hour. But yeah. um, depending on in, if people are interested in doing that, I could for sure introduce the, what it is and how it works and maybe make a little demo. 
I would listen. Yeah, for sure. I don't understand what, what the man very well they verify. Yeah, so maybe that would be a good discussion, like how it is verifying and what it's doing and, and why we need to do that. And, yeah, you know, why we need to do it, it's it's like number one. Sometimes I, exactly. is, I heard about yeah. projects and they, I think I'm stupid because I don't get what is it about. Oh, that's okay. I think that's, that's a valid point. And um, I think understanding why it's required is already half the work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that sounds, that's cool. Like, so I, well, maybe we can talk in Riot and get you scheduled like next week or in a couple of weeks or something. Yeah, sure. We can do that. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Chris, looks like we can see your screen now. Hooray, success. Okay. Yeah, very nice. So um, I'm just going to share this, which is um, kind of, this will explain a bit of the history of, you know, uh, what we've been doing over the last year or so, actually. We were one of the first teams to start building on tot on Substrate back in December 2018, um, when Substrate was still pretty unstable. Um, and we finished a proof of concept in February, so it was really quick to get up and running. Um, and that was uh, just proving the, the notion of what we wanted to show, which was for accounting ledgers, which normally post to a kind of uh, you know, sort of private database that, that doesn't really post outside of that database, we could get ledgers to update to any party that was concerned with any particular transaction. So just to give you a, an example of what that means, when you create a, an invoice, normally you have your customer who's one party to the, the transaction that's about to happen and yourself. But normally when you create an invoice, it just gets stored in your own local database. And then you have to somehow communicate that to your customer. Um, that's you know one part of the process. And the other part is that usually that invoice might have sales tax related to it, which you have to communicate to the tax, the sales tax office at, at the end of a quarter or whenever your sort of um, period is. So you have three parties that are involved with any particular sort of document creation that should be party to that document the moment it's created, or at least that's the view that uh, this, this project kind of came out of. And the idea being that the moment you create your invoice, you post the res relevant liabilities to your customers accounting, and you update the, like the tax accounting as well at the same time. It, and it's not something that's kind of immediately obvious to anybody who's ever, um, you know, if you're, if you're creating a startup and you're, you're coding and you're just sort of going away, at some point you're going to have to create an accounting system. And normally what you do is you download a piece of software and then you buy a license fee or you just give all your paper receipts to your accountant who then encodes all those receipts again into their own accounting software and so on and so forth. So it's a very manual, manually intensive process. And what the idea of a blockchain is, is essentially that you can communicate between any relevant parties, pieces of information that's relevant to them. Um, and that, that was basically the principle on which the, the proof of concept was done. Um, so then we set about sort of looking at how that would be implemented on, in, in a kind of easy to use fashion, because what you, you, although there's a lot of technical stuff going on under the hood, when it comes to actually operating it, it should operate like an, a normal application, even though we're talking about peer-to-peer -peer interactions, it should you know, sort of behave like a normal application. So over the months, what we've come to find is that we need, obviously we need our public blockchain network, which will store some, but not all of the information. So we don't really want to store um, data that's either publicly identifying individuals who are interacting with the network or information that might be of a, a text nature. For example, like you wouldn't want to store your customer's actual uh, physical location address on the blockchain because it makes no sense to do that. So what you kind of need to have is you need to have the support of some other kind of service which um, stores that information. And so what we have here is we, we basically have a totem client which interacts with these other services that we've built over the months. So um, 
with with a substrate what you you immediately have is the ability to create a kind of a ui server either using polka.js which is what we've uh, migrated to because we started off with 007 bonds uh, gavin's original framework for interacting with with, uh, with um substrate um so this this ui server will serve um, a client who then basically connects directly to the database and that's more or less what we see with polka.js apps as well and um, behind that we've built this message server which allows an off-chain peer-to-peer communication mechanism between parties and i'll kind of go through that when we look at the the front end that i posted um, and then obviously in order to react uh, interact with the chain we need some kind of funding for the individual um, identities or addresses that appear within our client um, and so we built a faucet server which kind of handles requests via our message server and sends transactions that appear uh, on, on the client side and again we'll see that in our UI but one big thing that we sort of came across a big kind of problem was that the information that we store off chain kind of needs to be queryable in a way that's um, scalable and i know that a lot of projects kind of look at ipfs as a way of storing some static information um, but that didn't really serve our purpose and it's mainly because even if you store the information on ipfs in order to query that information, you still have to go and get it and then sort of load it into memory and then you can query it. Then you can sort of do some, some, some queries upon that information. But we might be talking, for example, about a database of all public companies. And if you look at the UK, for example, you have 5.7 million companies registered in the UK and that takes up a database of around 4.5 gigabytes. So it's a, a database that you'd want to query if you were uh, doing expenses, you'd want to know that the company that you were entering in, in your expense claim was there, it was a genuine company. Um, but using IPFS alone is probably not the way to go. So we still haven't sort of figured out exactly how this is um, going to work at scale, but we know that there has to be some kind of database mechanism supporting off-chain data that will be sort of available publicly um, that we've we've come up with this sort of principle called the bonsai principle which we're going to sort of write about in the coming months but essentially um, just to give a, a brief indication what that is we will only allow storage in this database server if a hash of the data is is online it is is actually stored on the blockchain so in other words a client needs to sign that hash and is basically claiming ownership of that piece of information and then a database server if it receives an instruction to update needs to check that the hash of the data exists on chain and if it does then essentially it will say yes okay I'll, I'll store this data and there's a probably an economic model that we could work out around this whole function itself but that's that's to come later um so so this is an indication of what the um uh, what the architecture is um behind totem at the moment we're just currently using json files but we've just migrated to couch db or we will be in the coming weeks and um, because to fix done some work on that um, and uh, hopefully then we will be able to implement bonsai to allow us to do this kind of um, permissioned storage of information so any questions at this point no uh, okay i mean i would just be down to talk through your diagram a little bit more these are okay. like helpful architecture diagrams. So like, if I'm just some user of this thing, well, okay, first question, I guess, w is this the kind of thing that I would use for like my household budgeting or accounting, you know, like where I take a salary in and I pay rent and I pay, you know, groceries and et cetera, or is it more like business oriented? Um, well, I mean, we don't see um, a distinction between the two. 
Oh yeah. So there, there is a distinction, but you'll see online if we, if we go to the the UI in a minute, you'll see that there is a distinction between the two online because that's kind of a bit how people um, divide up you know, mm -hmm. the, their information. And and the idea would be that over time, as more people use this, then yes, you know, you go to your grocery store and rather than having a paper receipt, mm -hmm. you can share with them your totem identity, and then when they create the, you know, the till entry the entry of the at the, uh, the point of sale it would appear in your account automatically without you having to actually do anything like enter the information reconcile it with your bank account or anything like that so just the fact of you sharing your identity with them is enough that they would be able to post directly to you the information that's relevant to you Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be the same with Uber, for example. May, there may be a, a field inside Uber that just says, enter your totem identity here. And you could create a specific identity for Uber, as opposed to your local grocery shop, which might have a different identity. And then Uber, rather than emailing you the invoice, would just trigger a transaction, which would enter it into your accounts automatically. So this kind of gives this notion of everything being connected together. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah. you could do this with a centralized service. The, the problem with that is that you're competing against all of the other accounting packages who probably would want to do the same. And you would have to end up sen uh, basically having an economic model which relies on license fees. Mm -hmm. um, but with a blockchain, you have two types of user. You have a passive user who can just read the information doesn't need to interact with it doesn't need to make transactions and you have an active user who who does make transactions an active user in, for the main would be a business of some kind but the passive user would be the home user who just says okay you know I just want some way of tracking the information that I've got and I'm relying on the other parties who are normally businesses to do that for me mm -hmm. So have you, are you indicating anything particular with the colors that are on the diagram here? Like, is there a reason that the uh, desktop client, for example, is yellow or that like some of the blockchain nodes are different colors? Well, actually, um, it, it is, but it's probably not, you know, there's, there's no, in, no difference between the block. Hang on. What have I got here? I've, <laughs> I've written it here. Oh yeah. Red. Right. So, so an, a red would be a node offering public RPC connection. Okay. Um, a white would be just other nodes on the network. Um, basically, a public RPC connection would be any um, node that's saying, okay, we will allow the client to connect to us and interact with us directly. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's why there's the dashed line to all the red ones. Okay, yeah. great. And then what is the green one, number five there? That's like one that Totem is operating? Um, that, that's one that Totem or a private company might be operating. Okay. Um, the, the green over here indicates, because we foresee the possibility that in future companies might say, you know what, we want to run our own UI. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to deploy our own skin on whatever it is mm -hmm. that you're doing or develop their own UI at full stop. So they could do that themselves and still make use of this connection, still make use of the underlying architecture to connect to a public network. They might also say, okay, we want just to have internal messaging. So we don't really want our messages to go to the outside world. So we'll run a server that does internal messaging. And we might just also fund our own local users inside the company from our own faucet rather than a public faucet. And the database with all the information that we consider private, we want to run that ourselves. So this gives them the flexibility to pick and choose which types of deployment they want to create. Um, and so that's why we've, we've given it those colors. So everything that's in green could be deployed either individually or together um, inside a business if they wanted to handle things that way. But the, the, the UI that you're about to see is everything here. And then the blue is just the blockchain itself. Um, I have, what I haven't put on here is obviously the connection to the Polkadot network, which could theoretically allow multiple totem blockchains running privately as well within companies and having the communications run across the Polkadot network to a private company in, well, in and out of a private company. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that, that would be a sort of a greater version of this 
this. Yeah. Okay. So, so the the blue box labeled uh, totem public blockchain. That's the plan is that that's a parachain, and like some of those nodes are collators, and other of those nodes are maybe validators on Polkadot that are also connected to all the other validators. Um. Well, yes, that that would be outside of this, but mm -hmm. but yeah, that more or less that's uh, the view of what could happen. Cool. Okay. So. I'm, I don't know if anybody's actually already visited this, but this is the, the site that we have live. Um, just to give you a clue, okay, we haven't got a huge number of nodes behind there, but if anybody wants to ride, uh, run a node, they can. Um, and this is it running on the, uh, the well, you can see this in Polkadot.js apps. Now, I have to say that in doing the development of that architecture, it's taken us a long time and we decided to fix to version one because of all the stability issues that we had right from the early days of uh, Substrate. So in order to build out the architecture and to address the, the UI design that we wanted and the UI behavior that we wanted with respect to the chain itself, we decided to fix it on version one. But that's, that's something we we plan to change obviously to move to version two because there's so much more that's been added to substrate in the interim um it does require a bit of a rewrite of some of our back end unfortunately and that's you know sort of we've had a bit of a trade-off here of either pushing forward with the ui and the interactions with our our, um, our back end or or um face kind of stability issues and having to change things as as time went on so um so that's basically you know sort of where we are yeah was, like you're saying i think if i'm hearing you right it's like if we wanted to keep up with substrate master you know we'd be facing breaking changes in substrate every week or something like that and then all your change all your time would be devoted to keeping the blockchain part updated and you never have time to do all the other uh, off-chain stuff that you showed yeah that's right so you know, inevitably we will have to move to version two. There's no question of that. But, but as you say, you know, we've prioritized getting the business logic, which is mainly on the sort of front end here, mm -hmm. uh, uh, created. So it, I don't know if you want to do this um, directly. Um, people maybe want to go into their browsers. And as I said, it's a kind of interactive session. So we're going to go through a sort of a, a number of steps here. Um, what, I can't do this anymore because I've onboarded already, but when you start up, you get a default identity, which you can change the name of and, and give yourself um, your own name. And you can actually switch between those identities um, here. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I'm doing it right now. So like I clicked on that, yeah, you, it looks like you can't, but I clicked on that edit default identity. Yeah, I can't you? because I've gone through the onboarding process. And, and the idea here is that we want something that's so simple that people don't realize they're actually going to interact with the blockchain. So it's, it's more like a normal application. And yes, there are other steps like backups and things like that, that we want to get people to do, but that's, that's um, kind of a learning process that people will have to go through as, as we as we kind of onboard them and take them through. <clears throat> and this is the, the chat user itself is the messaging service that I referred to. So in order to keep sort of all communications kind of off chain or peer to peer, we're using this messaging service, which helps us communicate things between users. <clears throat> okay, and so once you've, once okay. you've onboarded with that, actually, you know, just Sort of, um, you, I can communicate and if you just see that troll box we can all communicate with each other and send a message through <coughs> that's a so <laughs> okay so okay that's good so uh, <laughs> We can all sort of register a, a bit and, and, and join the, the service. Once that's done, just run through <coughs> what so we've got Chris, here. I've got a question actually. Well, so, or a couple observations, I guess, just to get familiar with this. Like one thing I noticed is as I finished my registering thing, it uh, came up with a notification like faucet request in progress. And then a couple seconds later, like maybe when the next block was authored, it said like faucet request successful. 
Yes. So that's part of registration. I just get a couple tokens to use this. Yes, you get the idea is that smaller businesses will not consume huge numbers of tokens because the activities will consume tokens as as people do things and we'll see that. Um, but larger businesses will consume large numbers of tokens. So that's kind of where the economic model should be. And we we don't aim to have like a high cost for the tokens. It should be sort of minuscule. <clears throat> infinitesimally small you might say but um uh this this will get people going you know will get pe people started and allow them to to do activities so uh, right if, on the and left the, hand side the next thing i noticed maybe this is what you were about to say is the the ui is pretty interesting like uh i'm not you're not selecting one of those tabs you're like toggling which ones show up and i think like right now it's none but then you can show some yeah, other ones. That's right, I can show any ones that I want and then I can switch some off, uh, you know. And, and actually, this is this is an evolution of what Gav created at the beginning. Um, you know, we've, take, we've just basically used the same um, semantic UI framework for it uh, and then just kind of built on that and, and, and built the kind of sort of ideas that we want um, from that. And this is so, using Polkadot.js API? Connected yes. chain? Okay. Uh, well, not. It's not using the. Uh, not, not. Sorry. That. Sorry. Yes, it is. Yes, yeah. it's using yeah. Polkadot JS basically, yeah. and and we're connecting. I think this, we've completely removed now 007, unfortunately, but uh, but that's is now all using this. And to, just to go through sort of some of the process. So, what we would expect here is obviously there's there's some things that are not yet implemented, uh, and we'll go through and build these on a you know, a step by step basis, but the underlying, um, the underlying mechanisms are there. So for example, I'm going to, I'll just run through something. I'm going to create an activity here. Uh, let's just take this and I'll show you. So this is create. This is actually creating a transaction, and some of this information is stored on chain, and some of it is stored off chain. So the transaction has gone through now. And if we just look at the, um, so it should normally appear here. There you go. Pro a project registered. So that was something that was registered uh, just now. <clears throat> um, now what I can do with this, this particular project that I've created, so I'm gonna to have to move my little screen thing out of the way. I've got sort of teams, I can invite people to my team. I can change the information if I want to. And some of this information is stored on chain as, uh, as I say, but not all of it. Uh, in this case, that update wasn't stored on chain although you've got similar messages coming through. And then I can look at, for example, the technical details behind it, and I can copy this and go to, um, <coughs> excuse me. Well, we actually changed the name from projects to, uh, oh, hang on, not deleted project, that's, uh, Let's just try that. So here, this I guess this should be me. So uh, to, this is just to prove that it is it is actually happening on chain. If I open up my identity, and that uh, um, if I go and look at my own identity here, you can see that the the owner of that um, project. Or activity is actually me so so that was recorded on chain and hopefully if you're the user you, you have no idea that that's what's going on under the hood um, but for this this particular project for example I'm going to invite somebody to uh, to join my team so first of all I have to list them as a team member um, but I'm going to I can I can't add them directly because I don't know who they are so I'm going to request them. And in this case, I think, what, what was your username, Joshy? Was it just, um, just I think I did Joshy Orndorff, no space. 
O R N D O R F F. And it, like Alex has and whoever else has done this has a key pair now, I guess, and like an account on the chain that's being managed by our browser. Um, no, this is this is off chain. This is being managed by the messaging service at this particular point. So is there anybody else who wants to give me their username? I can add it here. Can you, I think you can see them in the troll box maybe. I know Alex. Yeah, let me just do that. I'll close that for a second and then quickly go in there. Okay, Alex Pickle and Joshi. Okay, so I'm going to basically request you as um, so this means we're like um, having a, a business together or like we're going to, I'm going to be a customer of your business or something like that. Yeah, hey, that's right. Uh, have, was that correct? How did, was it Alex? KS. Like that? Yeah. Nope. I'll just do you separately for the moment, Joshy, just to, just to show you. So, okay, I'm going to ask you to do some. Okay, this is not working for some reason. Do you need the ad? Yeah, I should. Oh, there we go. I think it's because my window is right on top of the buttons here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you, you should get now a little invitation, a little bell button at the top of your screen, which should yeah. sort of indicate. Yeah, that little, oh yeah, like you can't see it, but just to the left of that clock, I have a little red uh, bell and I click on it and it says, at Chris requested an identity, reason, timekeeping on an activity. Yeah. So, so I'll say just share. Um, okay, identity to be shared. I only have this one, so I'll do that. And then it says, the next field is change the partner name. This will be seen by recipients. Do I need to put so, anything in there? Well, so if you wanted to change your name there, uh, rather than give your own name away, maybe you wanted to put some other name there, uh, you could do that. And I would only see your other name. I wouldn't see, I wouldn't see necessarily your own identity. Okay. Uh, Joshy's incognito name. <laughs> Okay, submit. Right. And so you just, sent. So I, I've got this reply from you. And now I can add it to my partner list. And here I can choose whether it's a business partner or a personal partner, which is what I said before. Um, and I can choose to associate it with a particular identity that I have or not. I can just leave mm -hmm. it blank if I want to, but I'll, I'll associate it with Chris. And that would be, you know, you can think of this as maybe the identities being individual companies and maybe you want to associate it with one company or another. Uh, yeah. And I won't make it public, but it, it's just... So is that is that like decide partner visibility, public private? Is that basically like non-technical language for is this thing going on chain or not? Or does that... Actually, make... Well, no, partners themselves can be business partners. And we we added this because we thought that as people are using Totem, they could help us build the list of companies that were uh, legitimate companies that were out there that could be public. So for example, I'm just if I click public there, I have the identity address itself, I have the company name, which um, I could choose, but then I'd have to have the registered number of the company in the country of registration. So this is all about building the public database of of companies. It could be Uber, for example, if you had their public registered number and their registration company, you could add Uber to the public database. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure whether that's useful since we've changed to this um, new database itself, we can upload that information directly without needing it to come from the front end. So it was something that is kind of a bit of a legacy tool that we had okay. thought of at the beginning. So uh, you, you've now been added um, and I can now add you to, to the team. So I can't remember what the activity was. Oh, there we go, the demo tasks. I can invite you to uh, this particular team because you're now 
partner of mine. I can also add myself, by the way, to, to an activity. And in this case, I'm adding you. And this is actually taking place on chain. So now the fact that um, you're being asked to join the team is being added on chain. And you may have noticed just there, it said um, the transaction is being added to the queue. Mm. So we realize that in this, the whole mechanism itself, um, people might be offline when they're doing some of these things. So we've built in a queuing mechanism underneath that allows people to operate this without necessarily being online. And then when they come online, it executes the transactions for them and sends them off to the blockchain. So, so that it gives them that flexibility if they're doing, using it on their mobile phone, for example, which you can do, uh, they get that kind of on-off ability. So, okay, you've just accepted to be a team member and here's where it kind of uh, comes into play. If you go to timekeeping now and you click on the timer button, you should be able to add some time to that particular project. <clears throat> and if you open the window, you'll see that there's a uh, enter manual duration button and you can just uh, put some time okay. in there. Yeah, I see it. Okay, so I just am going to say I'm entering 10 minutes that I spent working on the code. Uh, okay, submit. Okay, and then it says it's asking me to confirm like submit time, please verify the following information and click proceed. So I'm just saying like it asked my name, the activity is like totem demo tasks, duration 10 minutes. Oh, number of blocks 40. That's interesting. What's that about? Yeah, so um, basically, we're measuring time with blocks. So we also have sort of the notion of the actual time itself, but maybe somebody's working during a day and they start and stop and start and stop. But actually there's, there's, elap there's therefore elapsed time and there's actual measured time. Mm -hmm. And we just decided, okay, our block time is about sort of uh, 10 seconds. So mm -hmm. we'll just measure it with a, it's not, you know, it's not, if you were actually properly wanting to rely on a timestamp, you wouldn't use the block time because, you know, it's too variable. There, there, there are possibilities for variability, but on average, the block time is, you could make it sort of, use it for a calculation and that's what we're doing here. Yeah. Um, and that, that it's, um, so it's, yeah, so rather than using the actual timestamp that the client is looking at, we're saying, okay, we can say uh, that a certain amount of time is equivalent to a certain number of blocks, even though it isn't actually blocks itself. Yeah, it makes sense. So I entered that. Yeah. Uh, another way of looking at that is if I start the timekeeping button, what you'll see is a little timer occurring here. And that little timer, if I close the window now, will continue to run until I decide it should stop. And actually, it's, it's counting the time that's passing, but it'll, it'll also do a calculation to say how many blocks have passed in that time. Um, and if I press stop, for example, I can then submit that time to this particular activity and so on and so forth, or, or just cancel it. And this what we've been doing is going backwards and forwards between each other. And we've never, let's say we've never met before, but mm. we've just essentially had an accounting like interaction with each other within a very short space of time. And the, the mechanisms that we've built have allowed us to do that with some on chain storage and some off chain storage, peer to peer communication. I mean, it could, it could have been anyone I could have invited uh, sort of anybody else here. So I'll just copy that because I've, yeah, it's well, it's funny, Chris. I also like at some point when you were talking, tried to add Alex as a partner, and I, I couldn't get it to show up there. Okay, there might there might be an an issue we'd have to yeah. to look at. Okay, we'll see. Yeah, um, and then of course we've got the obviously the underlying uh, transfer. You know, I could send you a hundred units of transactions, and that would allow you to do a certain amount of stuff for example. So I've just sent you a blockchain transaction. And eventually this would be the mechanism that would be used to potentially settle invoices. If, 
if you have enough of the transaction tokens, you could say, okay, well, I will give you a number of transaction tokens in exchange for what I owe you um, for, the, um, for the work that you've done. Let's just go through. So, did you submit that timekeeping record? Right? Uh, I think, yeah, I thought they did. Let's see. Oh, yeah, they I, would, oh, I would see it in timekeeping. Yeah. Or do you so see now, it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see because it. I'm the manager of this team, I get to see it here and I can uh, accept it or I can display it. So I can see, you know, some information about this particular uh, time record. Now, because it was a manual entry, the, the start block and the end block are not correct with respect mm -hmm. to the number of blocks that were submitted but I could uh, dispute hasn't been implemented yet uh, we can approve and reject and I think there may be a bug so I'm, I'm going to approve it but we, mm -hmm. there might be a bug there so I'll just warn you now it's okay that's what seminar is all about <laughs> so this like the, the thing we're, we're simulating now is that like I'm employed by your company or contracting with your company or something. And then I like basically submitted an invoice saying like, Hey, I worked on your stuff for 10 minutes. And then at some point in the future, you'll pay it or like not if you think I'm trying to scam you or something. Yes. We've simulated the first part of that, which is the kind of the management of, of time. Mm -hmm. um, the next step would be, the creation of the invoice from the time record. So oh, there's, there's okay. a kind of roadmap that we're following, of a kind of logical roadmap in order to implement the underlying blockchain part and the UI part bit by bit. So invoices, credit notes, purchase okay. orders, management. So it's like, I, I just like logged one shift and I'll do, you know, 30 more of those this month. And then at the end of the month, then I'll send you an invoice. Yes, yeah, you could, okay. you'll be able to pull all the time that you've you've sent and uh, invoice me based on that. Um, so I approved there, I, I approved your time here. So it should show up as approved. Sorry, is it? No, I approved your time there. So it should, if you look at your record now, you might have to close the window and open it again on the, sorry, close the module and open it again if it hasn't shown up yet. Um, yeah, I see it approved. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so be, but like, uh, yeah, can I, should we go through like how I invoice you or something like that? Or, well, this is to be developed. So this is oh, okay, the state okay, of play, but right at the edge of what, what we've done. But just to give you another sort of quick look at what we've done here, we've built in a history, which kind of shows everything that's gone on. And inside that history, we have some settings here, which we can configure the limit of the history, or we can just delete bits of history from here. This helps us from a developer perspective work out what's going on if users have problems. Um, but it's this is not kept, this is all local, so we don't store this information on our servers. This is per user, so it's um, stored like in your browser. That's right, it's just stored okay. in local storage. Okay, so that, that's that's why we've set a limit here. Um, the intention is that at some point when we were looking at transfer just close the history at the moment it's transactions but we will eventually be able to sort of do conversions to other currencies so although the underlying cryptocurrency is there it will be converted to the rate um you know to the us dollar rate or the euro rate so yeah. that end users will just have the impression that they're paying with those currencies rather than uh, the underlying cryptocurrency as you can do with any sort of normal crypto wallet now, you can sort of tap in the amount in US dollars and, and pay that and it converts mm -hmm. into the cryptocurrency. Um, and we have so, we have this uh, language support as well that we're looking to, uh, yeah, looking to work out. So, okay, there's a, this is what, this is the bug that's happening. So the approved transaction record is going to be executed a number of times now. Oh, cool. So it's, it's just oh, sitting sweet. In, so I'm just racking up time. Yeah. <laughs> and it, so, uh, so yeah, we've got, um, uh, language support. Chris, can you show us just like where the code lives and stuff so that we can, you know, if people are interested, they can sort of like dig into the palettes you've written. Is this all one palette or you have a couple of different palettes there? In your no, mind? there's a couple of different ones. I can show you that. So we have, we mainly have been using GitLab from the beginning of the project. So there's a few more repositories here, 
than you will see, for example, on uh, GitHub. But uh, the main the main ones these are just mirrored from GitLab. So you, mm -hmm. if you raise issues on either of them, then then we'll find them. Um, I can just go into. So th these are we just have a handful of um, backend servers at the moment. So uh, backend services on the blockchain. So we have the timekeeping service. Uh, you know, it's it's quite long. It's quite detailed. It supports a lot of the activities that are behind there. And here, for example, a timekeeping record, we, we have a number of sort of things that can change state over time. Um, and those are what that's what's actually being stored on the blockchain. Um, so we're not storing the descriptions or anything like that. It's really just anything that can change state we'll store, but anything else not. Um, yeah, great. Yeah. I won't go through the code line by line, but we've got projects obviously as well that supported, that actually supports the activities. We changed the name of that because projects seem to be too specific and it seemed to be conflicting with people's ideas of projects inside uh, GitHub, for example. Um, yeah. Whereas activities is more general. It, you, you could create an activity for a task or a group of tasks. It's however you want to sort of configure it. We have. Uh, an archive module. I didn't show this, but in inside the timekeeping itself, you can archive um, the records that you don't want to see anymore. Um, mm. There you go. So we can we can archive those records, and it'll kick off two transactions um, to to do that, and they'll hopefully be removed from the the list when that completes. Um, we have this thing called box keys, which is the beginning state actually of um, we're implementing a key registry for uh, encryption and signing keys that are that are not specifically related to an address, but uh, so you can sort of enter your own specific set of uh, encryption and signing keys, and this does an automatic validation. Um, so. I, again, I won't go into this, but this is something that we're building in, in order to begin the process of storing data encrypted in the, um, in, where is that diagram again? So any, any data that will go through the message server, for example, should be encrypted on the client first before it's sent to the, to the database. And because that data is only specific to the client, it should be encrypted by something that the the client knows about so the the client's own keys and uh, this is kind of you know sort of one of the processes that we're working on going forward and and that's that's kind of there's a lot more to what we've done and i guess as people can play around with it they can see um you know with within within the, the partners and identities modules for example there's there's more things i I won't show my seed, but uh, <laughs> I can I can show this one. No, so you can copy your seed. Uh, we've implemented a partial um, HD wallets with the idea oh, that uh, yeah. with companies, for example, if a company want, has a a seed at uh, at the top level of the organisation, they may assign individual uh, seeds with with uh, HD paths to to other members of their company yeah right cool okay great thank you chris thanks for the demo and the tour very that's great yeah thanks cool and then i guess we've got just 13 minutes left so alex hopefully that's enough for you to show us your ci builds finished and the end result of pushing with polka hub no unfortunately i i think i found a bug <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, uh, the new versions of Substrate uh, have no uh, build scripts, and uh, eventually, I think it, it, there is. Uh, this is a reason why CI builds failed. <laughs> yeah. So okay. We yeah. will need to. I, I'm curious. I'm curious which which like uh, which script is it that you used to use or that's that's changed? Just uh, you know, I can always give feedback to devs or like help find the path forward. No, it's just uh, there was a build script for uh, separate uh, wasm process, and uh, we mm -hmm. were accounting in, 
we were we're building the the whole image using using this script also because mm -hmm. we needed to. And now simple car, car, cargo build is enough, and uh, there is no build shells file. <laughs> and that's oh, I see. You can do it with cargo now. You're saying like it's maybe yeah, a, yeah. a good change, but you just haven't updated for it yet. Yes. Okay. So okay. We, we we just uh, will need to tweak our own uh, scripts. So yeah, that's cool. totally okay, but uh, we forgot to do that. Okay, yeah, great, great, no problem. Um, well, I guess, yeah, I, I had offered to talk about proof of work, but I think at this point we don't have enough time left to do it. So maybe, uh, I guess, like, we can just plan on next week, maybe I'll do uh, proof of work, and Will, or if you're down to do SR tool, we can just, like, commit to that for next week? Yeah, sure, no problem. Okay, awesome, that sounds great. Cool. Josh, I wanted to ask you, uh, do you keep track of all the projects that uh, are featured here on Seminar? Oh, that's a good question. I guess I've only kept track in as much as I post all the recordings on YouTube. So I don't mm -hmm. have like a, a page of all the stuff we've talked about, but if that's just, useful, I'm open to the idea. I remember uh, some project, uh, uh, someone did a visualization of all the substrate dependencies. Do you remember that? After the seminar, I looked through some stuff we'd recorded in the past, and the tool that Alex was asking about was called Substrate Depths, and it's written by my colleague Steve, and it's here on GitHub. This is him with all the I's and F's, and I'll just drop this link in the uh, show description here on YouTube. And then I got a message in the chat from Telmo. He says, "Don't." It was while Chris was talking. He says, "Don't want to interrupt for this. I'm in CET and have to leave early." Blah blah blah. Uh, say thanks to Alex and Chris for sharing. So, and thanks from me too. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks very much, Joshi. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hey, big thanks to you guys. It makes uh, it makes hosting pretty easy on days like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, all right. Thanks good. Thanks a lot for everybody who came too. And um, so, just I guess like Will and I will go next week, and I'll update all the calendar invite and everything, and then hopefully we'll be square on the time moving forward. Looking forward to that, and thanks for the demo, guys. Yeah. Big thanks. Thanks very much, Will. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.